So for our next blast, we have with us Eric Feldman, who is our valued coordinator in the Office of Global Learning Initiatives. Eric holds two degrees from FIU, having completed undergraduate work in SIPA and graduate study in the College of Education and Higher Ed. He's our go-to staff member for planning engaging outside of the classroom activities, advising student organizations, managing our web communications, so he's someone that you would want to contact for that, developing promotional materials for your courses and activities, we help to promote your courses and activities, and collaborating on special outreach activities. In addition, Eric teaches a first year course on college success, research, writing, and leadership skills for the Honors College. He is a never ending fountain of support and knowledge, and we encourage you to contact him. Um, Eric. Stephanie. So the word that really sums up the work that I'm going to talk about is opinion. I, deal, I like to deal with the messy and imperfect work of how students form opinions, uh, which some could debate that you know, higher education is a place for facts and not opinions. But considering how opinions shape how we view the world and how we make decisions and interact with others, I wanted to come up with some things that would enable students to form opinions that meet a couple of criteria. Um, that they are opinions that move past their preconceived notions and things they've always thought, but are ones that are formed after thoughtful analysis, that they are based on reliable sources and information, and that their opinions can lead to improved uh, ability for the communities they're part of to solve problems. Um, to be a little more pithy about it, um, I want them to be able to think like this, that it's okay to disagree with someone without thinking the person they disagree with um, is evil or Hitler or uh, anything like that. It's okay to disagree. An activity that I like to do is to come up with a list of hot button ethical issues. This is a screenshot of just one example. It's a whole page of different ethical dilemmas. This particular dilemma says that a Greek organization wants to host a charity fundraiser, and the charity fundraiser, fundraiser is a contest where students, male students or both, have to dress up as ugly women, including the use of blackface, and you know the ugliest uh, woman wins, or male dresses woman wins, and this is all for a good cause. The students have to answer two questions about this one. Should the organization be allowed to host such an event on campus? And the second question, should the organization host the event on campus? Um, I really like this example because it's really hot button. It deals with racially charged issue. It deals with you know, gender charged issue. And it's something that students could actually deal with. Students are part of organizations that plan these types of events. And they're going to find themselves at some point having to work with other people in a group to decide this is the right thing to do, this isn't the right thing to do. Um, as an aside, this is actually a real case that I learned about in grad school in higher ed law. So I throw in the added that not only could this happen to you, this did happen to someone. Um, so once the students answer those questions, the room is divided into four parts. These signs are on all four corners of the room. They can either say that the ultimate positive, that it should be allowed and they should do it, the ultimate negative that they shouldn't do it and there should be a rule against it, or somewhere in the middle that it should be allowed or should, but you know there should be a rule, et cetera. Um, so you might hear someone in this corner say something like, you know, the university shouldn't prohibit it. That would be a violation of free speech. However, um, they shouldn't do it because it could hurt people's feelings and give a bad reputation, et cetera. Someone who's on the ultimate positive might say, it's for a good cause. The fact that um, it's so controversial, we'll bring more people to it, it'll raise more money, and the charity will get more money because of it. Um, the bottom right-hand corner is just more extreme of the top right, saying not only shouldn't they do it, it's so bad, there should be a rule against it, the university should stop it. And then I think the bottom left is the most interesting because anyone on that corner for any um, particular instance is saying that you should break the rules, and that does, students do provide justifications for that sometimes. Um, it's not really necessarily relevant to the ethical decision making part of it, but I like to throw in what the outcome of the, the court case was. And the particular court heard this case said that it, it was a violation of free speech for the university to discipline this group. Um, and so it's a good um, example to talk about what the court said that it's, well, what do you think? Um, exactly. My favorite part of this activity is when students hear each other's points of view. Um, at least one, not a couple, on, on, on most of the examples will then move sides of the room. 
um, this is really powerful to me because people, most, I'm sure the students, whether they, they hadn't thought about this case, but the students have their feelings about what's appropriate in terms of you know how you talk about other groups of people. They have opinions about free speech, and they came in with these opinions for years. But just because they heard another student say a sentence or two, they'll say, I never really thought about it quite like that. And, and I think that's really powerful because you're having these face-to-face in-depth conversations, and it's really hard to have this type of exchange in under 140 characters. And this is where most of our students are having these types of conversations with each other on Facebook, on Twitter, where there's not enough room to really get into it. Where you're not really talking with each other, you're talking at each other. And I think about in my even daily life, if I'm not in one of these activities I'm facilitating, the places I talk about opinions and issues and political issues are either social media, which I try not to do, seeing it on television and there's no dialogue, I'm just being absorbing, or with family, which I'm not really listening to because I know what their views are because I've been hearing it for years. Um, so outside of those, and I, I would like to think maybe that's where a lot of you talk about these types of issues too, if you're not in these forums with people from the community, with other students, being facilitated to actually discuss and listen to each other, then there's really no way to inform opinion. Now speaking of social media, I think that in the war to get students to use accurate information, it's the biggest enemy. And so as the instructor for this first year honors college class, I have the responsibility to talk a lot about library stuff. And library is fantastic. I worked with them in that class. They came into class and everything. And so we do cover peer reviewed journals and databases and et cetera. But I also tackle on social media head on because I feel like this is where students are, are getting a lot of false information. The, the credible folk always cites his sources. Um, so this is something that when I was wanting to talk about information literacy in my course last semester, I happened to, a couple days before, actually find this on my personal Facebook news feed. Um, there was an article spreading around really hot a button uh, uh, really quickly one day. It was a funny one, nothing really important, but it said that Samsung lost a lawsuit to Apple and they paid it in $1 billion worth of five cent coins and a bunch of dump trucks came to Apple's headquarters and, and paid a billion dollars in five cent coins. It was completely false, it was just a, a hoax, a funny internet thing. Um, but in no matter, in a matter of minutes, I saw it get posted, shared, 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 shared. Um, so I brought this into class for discussion as an example of I'm sure that, that this happens on the news feeds um, all the time. And I tell them, all I had to do was Google this story and tons of articles came up saying it was false. None of these people bothered to simply type it into Google and say, now, the added benefit of this, besides showing how easy it is to verify something, is the student will hopefully say something, and they did, like, yeah, but Google's not an accurate research source. How can, you ver how can you dispute it using Google? And I say, you're absolutely right. If I can't really reliably use Google to check this, you can't use them on your papers. But there's kind of a way to do it. Let's talk about how to find reliable information, how to use Google Scholar, how to tell the difference between news, or news organizations, scholarly sources on Google, et cetera. And then of course, there's a caveat that just because even it's from a reliable news information source, that doesn't mean it's true. Um, just yesterday, I'm sure that I'm not the only one here who got a, a news alert on my phone that they arrested someone in the unfortunate Boston incident. And then by the time I searched for it, they already said, oh, no, wait, we didn't. Um, and that's a problem that's been going on for a very long time. So. Um, I was interested in this kind of subject before ever hearing of the Kettering Foundation, but I've been very fortunate to have been working with a fantastic communication arts professor, Daniel Bloyer, and the FIU Debate Society with the Kettering Foundation, which is an organization that strives to create opportunities for citizens to talk to each other about um, important, wicked public issues. Um, and this fellow, Martin Martin, um, presented, and I took a picture of this slide because on the topic of good data, um, I'm going to move into the National Issues Forum, which is another uh, moderated discussion. And as a moderator, it's important to know the level of impartiality you're supposed to have. And I think moderators are typically seen as impartial uh, people in, in most circumstances. Um, so Martin here agreed with that, but there are some things he didn't want to be impartial about. So he came up with his passionate impartiality, which I think is an interesting um, subject, which, uh, concept, which when anyone says, you have to be impartial in a, as a moderator, 
you're there to help people form opinions, but not which ones. You're just guiding the process. But there are two things you can be impartial. You can be partial about. One is making sure that everyone is included and, and being treated equally in the conversation. So if a certain group of people or person is dominating, you can break your impartiality to make sure that all the different groups represented in the discussion um, are being represented. And um, to honor the importance of good data, um, having moderated um, events like this, I, I think this is very challenging to know when people are throwing out facts in these in-person forums, to be able to check them and to be able to know what's good or, or bad information is very challenging. But in the instance that you know that somebody is saying something that is absolutely false to maintain the integrity of your conversation, it's all right for a moderator. In his opinion, and I'm still um, wrangling with this, but I think it's, it's good if you absolutely know that it's false, that you can throw out that data as a moderator um, because to maintain the integrity of your session, you can't have um, blatantly false data. So that leads into the National Issues Forums, which is something that uh, Professor Blauer and I um, moderate together. Um, and this moves into the third part of things um, that I want opinions to do is to lead to improved community problem solving. National Issues Forums are a nationwide series of events that are loosely organized at the national level by this Kettering Foundation and then all sorts of communities, uh, community centers, universities, et cetera, host them. And so Global Learning hosts them with the Debate Society um, two to three times a semester. Um, and what they are are discussion forums that are for public and accessible terms. It's not rejecting the place of experts in public conversation, but this is the other place. So this is, there's no jargon. This is not relying on experts. This is folks speaking from their personal experiences um, and uh, in talking about what is affecting their communities. Um, some of the ones that we've already done at FIU, we've been doing them all this year, fall and spring. We've done Debt, Life After the Cliff, American Foreign Policy, Shaping Our Future, which is about the future of higher education, coping with the cost of healthcare, which we did in the College of Nursing and Health Sciences. And we use issue books. This is what I think really defines the National Issues Forums, is rather than just going in and starting talking, is everything is guided by these issue books. And I scanned one of the most uh, timely issue bulletins they just put out about um, gun control. And so gun control, there's pretty much two main viewpoints on it, which I find interesting because they're pretty much um, have less guns or have more guns. Um, so the issue guides I took two, but the issue guides always have three, sometimes four options. And what every issue guide does for each option is explain what the option is, we, some people think that we should do this because it would help this way, and it has positive benefits, et cetera. And then it has the specific actions. So it's the, kind of like the framework for it, specific actions. So for this one, which is gun control, require a waiting period, require uh, you know, to show permits, require you know, ban uh, high magazines, et cetera. For each action, it has a drawback. So if you restrict things, law-abiding citizens will lose rights. If you blah, 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 um, if you um, require a waiting period, it'll defend, it, people will have to, it'll miss some mentally individuals they don't know about, and people will have to wait to have uh, protection if they're in a situation, et cetera. And they're very well balanced. Like you cannot, it's almost frustrating how you can't get a good solution out of this because everything has an equal drawback. So that's the one for gun control. There's another one for uh, having more people opportunity to equip themselves. It explains why some people want this, what it would achieve. It says some things you can do are drill teachers to be able to, you know, have guns and, you know, protect students, et cetera. But that's going to cause a fearful situation in the schools and, and makes children, you know, at ease. Teachers might accidentally discharge a weapon, et cetera. So these, these, uh, dis these discussions are formed around these issue guides. We go through each, issue, each option one by one, discuss the pros and cons of the option. And as a group, it's like results oriented. We're supposed to kind of say what option is um, the best option or what combination of options and decide it as, as a group. So those are the issue forms. Some concerns and considerations with the issues forms or any work involving public discussion of opinions is ensuring representation of all groups. And this does not just mean within the forum, but who's coming to the forum? If I'm hosting this forum in a university, 
um, students or f folks in the community who didn't come to university for whatever reason are not going to be part of this important public discussion. If we're doing it out in the community, depending on how the ads for them are marketed, it might be welcoming one group over the other. You know, groups of people who have to be working in the evening when a community organization might host one of these or might not come. So it's really important to try that you're getting everyone to these uh, groups. Like I said, it's really frustrating. I'm really an indecisive person who likes to weigh every option, which is why I think these issue books really speak to me personally. And I usually leave them like, I, there's no right answer to everything. And in, in some ways, uh, that's an outcome I like because I like people to realize that there's no one right answer to anything. But some people do form opinions because a lot of folks are more decisive than I am. And I'm happy when I see people leaving saying that I think this is the right answer, that at least I know that they're thinking that because they've really thought about it and they've really listened to other people. Um, other than that, they just have always believed that. And spurring action, uh, which is another one where there's a lot of debate over um, the place of this. I'm careful, at least personally, not to any recommend any particular actions. Um, that goes along with the impartiality that, you know, I'm here to help you form opinions. I hope that you do something with those opinions and take some action. I'm not going to tell you what to do. I'm not going to get too involved with that part. Depending on your discipline or your uh, thoughts on that, you can be more or less active in spurring action, but I think the communication and deliberation skills that they've acquired through such activities will just naturally complement them the rest of their lives in, in dealing with actions in the community. If you're interested in being involved in National Issues Forums, you can send me an email. Um, we can try to find an issue guide relevant to your book and host one where your class can be invited. We can try to be able to in class. I can come do the uh, ethical issue activity in your class, perhaps, if you would like. Um, so. Do you think it would be possible if a faculty member didn't find a prepackaged issue book to mentor or work with a, with a class full of students and actually divide them into teams and perhaps have them, the students, create issues books? I think there would be a great activity for this as a class exercise, or we can even, if it's a serious project, try to work with the Kettering Foundation to have a, a class try to publish one of their issue books. Is I know um, some of the issue books have university logos on them, so I don't know if that's out of specific of the class needs, but they do work with, yeah. So of course, the students could develop, develop it, and then the students could host mm -hmm. a community forum. Yeah, and um, there are, uh, in the Kettering Foundation, we meet with we, we meet with, we meet with uh, schools that have been working with Kettering much longer than FIU has, which is this this year, and they actually have centers in, their, in the university that the centers have higher student assistance. The student assistants go out into the community to figure out what the problems are, and they actually have centers that run city council meetings by, are run by an issue forum format run by the students at the centers at the universities. And the school boards use them because these, these government institutions want to like, have outsiders run for them so there's no perception of bias and they use issue forum trained students for that. So that's all. I just want to put a, a plug in here. We have um, global learning faculty student fellowships. Thank you.